Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Uh, we have here today with us uh, Mr. Michael Link, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on the Situation of Human Rights in the Palestinian Territory, uh, occupied since 1967. His presentation to the General Assembly was originally scheduled for today, but it's had to be delayed to tomorrow um, at noon. So that's when he'll be speaking to the third committee. I'll pass the floor to him. Uh, press releases, uh, a press release just went out and it's in the back of the room. Please go ahead, Mr. Link. Thank you very much. I have a short statement to, uh, to read with respect to my report, and then I'm happy to take questions. Israel has occupied the Palestinian territory for 50 years with no end in sight. This is the world's longest running belligerent occupation. In my report this week to the third committee of the United Nations General Assembly, I examine the question of whether an occupying power engaged in a protracted occupation can at some point cross a red line and thereby become an illegal occupant. I have defined four requirements set out in international law by which an occupying power can abide, must abide by. One, the absolute prohibition on annexation of territory. Two, an occupant, occupation must be inherently temporary. Three, an occupying power must always act in good faith. And four, the occupying power must act in the best interests of the protected population. As I describe in some detail in my report, the extraordinary dur duration of the occupation, Israel's acquisitive and expansionary role in colonizing the occupied territory, the diminished Palestinian economy and the shrunken space for Palestinian daily life, and the systematic violations of human rights of the Palestinian people, all indicate that Israel has violated these foundational principles. The laws of occupation are very clear that the occupying power cannot treat the, tr the territory as its own, nor can it make claims of sovereignty. Yet, this has been uh, Israel's persistent pattern in governing the uh, occupied Palestinian territory for much of the past 50 years. In my report, I recommend, based on this analysis, that Israel's role as the occupying power has now reached the point of illegality. This is a seminal precedent in international law. In 19, early 19, late 1960s and early 1970s, the United Nations and the International Court of Justice declared that South Africa's mandate over Namibia was in violation of the fundamental tenets of international law, and South Africa's mandate over Namibia had now become illegal. This, is an, this was an important turning point in the long road between, towards Namibia's independence. This international community's failure to this point to answer Israel's splintering of the Palestinian territory and disfiguring of international law has been a great detriment to the peoples of Israel and of Palestine, as well as to the development of and respect for international law. International law is the promise that states make to one another and to their peoples that rights will be respected, protections will be honored, agreements and obligations will be satisfied, and peace with justice will be pursued. The international community has long demanded Israel to bring a complete and expedient end to the occupation. Instead, the occupation has deepened and thickened. The traditional approaches of international diplomacy have proven inadequate. We need a new toolbox. The tools of declaring Israel as the illegal occupant stands as one of the most effective possibilities of moving this century-old conflict and this half-century-old occupation to a durable and just end based on the principles of equality and human rights. Further, I call upon the international community to, to use the robust tools at its disposal to apply the pressure that is needed to ensure that Israel brings an end to the occupation and upholds its obligations under international law. It is only with the full commitment of the international community to the principles of international law that this is going to be resolved. I hope my report may provide a way forward on this issue, which has gone under, unaddressed for a long period of time. Thank you, and I'm happy to receive your questions. Thank you, Mr. Link. Yes, we'll start in the back. Yes, sir. 
My name is Masood Hader. I represent Daily Dawn newspaper from Pakistan. Mm -hmm. uh, your 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 appeal, I mean, passionate as it is, and you have been trying to counsel Israel to what you call abide by the various resolution of the United Nations and the in Geneva Assembly in General Assembly in Geneva. But Israel doesn't seem to pay heed to any uh, that uh, being said by the international community. Only think time it can listen is when pressure is exerted from the United States and its allies like uh, maybe UK and, and France. Is there any way that the people like you are able to communicate to the United States to take some sort of uh, uh, cognition of what Israel has been doing in the occupied territories and how egregious are those? Uh, is there a possibility, such a possibility? <coughs> the United States and the European community are significant actors with respect to this particular conflict, but they're not the only actors. There also are the actors that are in civil society, among human rights defenders, as well as other members of the diplomatic community that have long paid attention to and shown some sympathy with the, uh, the struggle to have in, uh, Palestinian self-determination. It'd be my hope that um, a, a study on the legality of Israel's continued occupation of the, uh, of the, of the occupied territories, of the determination by the General Assembly to seek another advisory opinion of the International Court of Justice, um, and as well, the states beginning to honor their obligations under common article number one of the Geneva Convention, as well as article 25 of the Charter of, uh, of the United Nations, which calls upon all member states to obey all directions of the Security Council. All of those put together, I think, have the, build, have the ability to begin to build a popular and diplomatic and, need I say, legal challenge to Israel's unobstructed continuation and thickening um, of, the, of the occupation. Um, superpowers such as the EU and, uh, and the United States do play a significant role, but if they're not willing to take the lead on this, I think there are numbers of other countries who are sympathetic to the plight of the Palestinians who would see this kind of toolbox that I'm recommending as a possible way forward. I'm, my desire to want to create this new toolbox is that the old toolboxes that we've used, the continuation of resolutions at the General Assembly, the continuation of resolutions at the United Nations, in and of themselves are not sufficient. It is a tribute to the international community that it has for, for as long as the occupation has lasted over the last 50 years, that there's been close international supervision of Israel's occupation over these territories and over the Palestinian people. But it is no tribute to the international community that as the occupying power has defied resolutions from the Security Council and the General Assembly and has deepened and thickened its occupation and is now at a state where it's proclaiming the possibility of further annexation of occupied territory. It is no tribute to the international community that it has stood aside and not developed these robust tools of diplomacy and law that it has at its disposal to be able to challenge Israel's uh, continued occupation. Uh, you have yourself, in, in this statement, I mean, you have yourself said that uh, the United States, uh, uh, I mean, Netanyahu has been saying time and again that he doesn't care about anything and that uh, East Jerusalem will be very soon part of the whole Israel, basically. And that uh, the United States ambassador, Nikki Haley, mm -hmm. has been saying again, oh, it's, there's Israel bashing going on. So it's all camouflage, and that Israel is under pressure. So the, the international community is unable to put any pressure whatsoever on Israel to abide by any international laws. I mean, they get away with anything that they want. I mean, building the <laughs> wall to anything else that you say. Yeah. And incarcerating children in jail. They've got away with everything. Yeah. So how do you think, what, what in your 
estimation is the, the so-called next move to what you call make these international community be aware of this? Sure. If I can answer two aspects of, of the question that you posed. One is the question with respect to Israel bashing, and I want to make it very clear. The mandate that I have as Special Rapporteur and the mandate of the item number seven that's on the permitted agenda of the Human Rights Council is not aimed at Israel. It's aimed at Israeli occupation of a territory that's not its own. That is a distinct and separate question, and those who wind up confusing the two do so, I suggest, deliberately to obfuscate the question of this 50-year-old occupation. And with respect to international pressure, I agree with you. You know, we do not see any evidence that there's going to be um, internal developments within Israeli politics that will lead to a successful end to the, uh, uh, to the occupation. Prominent Israelis of conscience have been asking for international pressure. And I just, if I can just quote one person here, uh, Amos Shokin, who's the, um, who's the publisher of, El, of uh, uh, Harat's newspaper, the influential intellectual daily of, uh, in Israel. He recently wrote about his own country's uh, leadership that only international pressure is precisely the force that will drive them to do the right thing. So if these prominent Israelis of conscience are asking for the international community to do something, it seems that the least that the international community can do is to be able to answer their pleas with the kinds of tools that the international community possesses to begin to review Israel's status as a law-abiding member state of the United Nations. Please go ahead. Mr. Link, uh, my name is Sherman Bryce P, South African Broadcasting, and on behalf of the UN Correspondents Association, thanks for this briefing. Uh, part of this toolbox of yours includes this uh, call for an opinion from the ICJ. Of course, you'll remember in 2004 there was an ICJ opinion as, as uh, it pertains to the wall and the yeah. illegality of the wall mm -hmm. that uh, and calls on the Security Council and the uh, General Assembly to act. Yeah. Uh, based on what that achieved, how does that sort of inform this call uh, or, or the incorporation of the ICJ in your toolbox? Sure. The 2004 Advisory Committee helped us, was, was beneficial in the sense that it helped to establish a number of key points in international law. The ICJ in 2004 affirmed that the settlements are illegal. It affirmed that the construction of the wall in the 85% uh, of which is in the occupied territory was illegal. It affirmed that East Jerusalem was illegally annexed. But the question asked in 2004, if you like, was relatively narrow. I'm asking for an advisory opinion that would address a much wider question. Much like the International, uh, the International Court of Justice addressed in 1971 in the Namibia question, where it, where it, asked, it was asked, was South Africa's continuing mandate as trustee over Southwest Africa or Namibia now illegal because of the 49 years of the mandate and the introduction of uh, apartheid into uh, Southwest Africa. And the International uh, Court of Justice said yes, South Africa's continuation is illegal. And that was, it, it, and I will admit, it took 19 more years until Namibia achieved independence after that. But that was an important tool to change public and diplomatic opinion with respect to that. I am saying that there are lots of similarities between the Namibia decision in 1971 and what I'm asking for in 2017, 2018, that if the same sort of question was asked, is Israel's continuing uh, position as the occupant now illegal? That raises the stakes of the international community on how to judge um, Israel's continued status within the world community. Uh, right now what we do is we regard Israel as the lawful occupant of the Palestinian territories, albeit with a range of uh, illegal features to it, the settlements, the wall, the annexation of East Jerusalem, the systemic uh, violations of, of human rights. If we now change that from being a lawful occupant to an illegal occupant, that raises, the, that raises the, the pressure on what the international community would now be obliged to do under its obligations of non-cooperation with, uh, with Israel in the continuation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Link. My name is Jordan Degams. I'm from Jordan News Agency. Um, I, I'm from Jordan, so I follow the whole story from the beginning. 
and um, I, 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 I really support what you say, but I have a question because my job is to ask a question about your legal push or the legal box and the legal tools you have. Mm -hmm. Don't you think that this is, no matter what, as my colleague stated, that it's not going to change unless the Security Council of the United Nations act according to Chapter 7 of its charter? Mm -hmm. It means that to impose sanction against the occupant, because otherwise we're going to have another 50 years of occupation. Do you think that the Security Council, as the origin, the organ of the United Nations that's responsible for peace and security, including Palestine, mm -hmm. that should change its resolution at least once to impose sanction on Israel if remain in violation of international law? And in this case, they support the toolbox that you are uh, proposing. Mm -hmm. What do you think? And after I have, with my colleagues, when they finish, I have another two small sure. questions. Sure, okay. There are a range of robust tools that the international community has diplomatically and legally to be able to answer a question of illegality. I suggest the first step is for the United Nations to investigate whether they agree with my illegal analysis that Israel now is an illegal occupant. If it finds that it is an illegal occupant, then I think the United Nations is in a position either through asking for an advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice and through its own internal mechanisms to begin to develop a range of successively more important or more imposing um, measures, sanctions against Israel as long as it remains in illegal occupation of the, uh, of the territories. I don't pretend this is going to happen tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. But I think if we begin to uh, find a new way of thinking how to handle Israel's ongoing defiance of UN resolutions and thickening of the, of the resolution, um, Israel itself at various times has expressed, I think, genuine concern about the adverse reaction from the United Nations. It did that after 2009 with the Goldberg report. It was worried about the reactions that may come from the international community with respect to that. It was worried in the aftermath of the 2014 report with respect to the, that war in Gaza in, the, in that particular year. It is worried now with respect to the civil society BDS movement. If the international community under the leadership of the, of the United Nations was, was ready to take and showed it was ready to take uh, unified actions on an escalating basis that as long as Israel refused to begin to honor Palestinian self-determination and withdraw the settlements uh, and its annexation of East Jerusalem, that would be, I think, the trigger where we would see a, a, a decisive turn in Israel's behavior in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the occupied territories. Just remember this, you know, if you compare, and the only reason I'm doing this comparison um, is, is, is for a very specific reason, because, because Israel is not North Korea. But if there are sanctions against North Korea, North Korea actually has very little to do in terms of trade with the outside world. Israel is very dependent upon trade with the outside world. It's very dependent upon its market in the United States. It's very dependent on its market uh, with Europe. If there was an understanding that all of a sudden Israelis wanting to travel abroad needed to have visas, if all of a sudden Israel wasn't going to get pre preferential trading agreements with the, with the EU, um, if all of a sudden uh, the many and multitude of forms of, of uh, military or economic cooperation or academic cooperation with Israel were now going to, to come to an end as long as Israel continued that, I think you'd begin to see a sea change in the attitude of ordinary Israelis and in the attitude of the, uh, um, of the Israeli government with, with respect to that. But that has to happen. Every journey of a, of a thousand miles begins with a single step. This may be the single step that we have to start taking. Right, uh, Benny Avni and then Matthew Lee. Okay. Um, so, uh, t uh, unlike some of your previous... Sorry, uh, sorry you didn't introduce yourself. You I'm Benny Avni with the New York Post and uh, the Daily Beast. Uh, oh, unlike yeah. some of your predecessors, you haven't, uh, in your report, mentioned any violations by Palestinians, by the Palestinian Authority, by mm -hmm. uh, by uh, mm -hmm. Hamas, and so mm -hmm. in Gaza, and so yeah. on. Uh, so, 
Why not? And uh, is that part of your mandate? Also, the second question I have is, uh, you come from a French-speaking country. Uh, I'm not very good in French. But the word rapporteur uh, has connotation, at least, of reporting. But it sounds from what you are saying and from your report that recommends uh, boycotts and such things um, that you are more advocating than reporting. Okay. We in journalism have that. You know, I'm an advocate. Okay. Okay, I, I'll answer both your questions. Um, um, I have been asked in the past uh, as to my mandate with respect to human rights violations by either the Palestinian Authority or, uh, or Hamas. Um, that's not my decision to make. That's the, that the, the, my mandate has been created by the Human Rights Council in Geneva. Um, one of my pro predecessors did recommend uh, no, um, actually it was Richard Falk, <laughs> did recommend to the uh, Human Rights Council several years ago that his mandate be expanded to be able to include that. I also note that Amnesty International several years ago has also asked that as well. Um, I am actively considering whether or not when I make my next report, which will be in March to the Human Rights Council, that I will ask for my mandate to be expanded. All I can do with respect to that is make a recommendation. The decision as to whether or not my mandate is expanded to be able to do that is belongs to the Human Rights Council itself. Um, and uh, but did, uh, uh, include some uh, reporting on Palestinian violations, Palestinian Authority violations. And, I, I, and I'm not going to dispute what you said. I, I'm, I'm unaware of that. I, have not, I read some, but not all of his reports with respect to that. If he did, I'd be happy if, if you would want to show that to me. And I just don't understand the thing about uh, the mandate because it says you're a special rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the uh, occupied Palestinian Right, and, but if you kept on reading for the, for the full description of the mandate, it, it focuses on the occupying power. So for me to be able to expand that, and look, I, I, I've heard arguments both ways, and I think there's good reasons both ways. Um, with respect to that, but watch what I do uh, when I uh, when I come in March. The other term, the other thing you've asked with is with respect to um, beginning to put more international pressure on Israel. I don't believe I've used the word boycott in my uh, 10,700 words in my um, uh, in, in my report. Well, he says you encourage, encourage member states to prevent corporations within their jurisdiction yeah. mm -hmm. from engaging in activities that would invest in or yeah. sustain the yeah. occupation. That's, that's very much a boycott, isn't it? Okay, all I'm saying is I didn't use the word boycott. You, you use that. But what I, what I am, but if I can finish, what, what I am, am saying, as many civil society organizations are saying, as even some Israeli organizations are saying, is not to buy goods that are produced in the, uh, uh, in the occupied territory under the label of being made in Israel. Um, those organizations are there, those companies or factories or uh, commercial enterprises are there in an occupation and um, their status there would be illegal. Fine, but, but my, my question was not specifically about boycott or that, but uh, about the actual, uh, what is your job, to report or to advocate? And it seems that most of what you're saying here about the ICJ and so on, mm -hmm. and, and this recommendation is more recommendation than actual reporting. It is reporting, but it, um, every single report I make, every single report that every other special rapporteur makes, has recommendations at the end. Um, and they make recommendations that push the envelope forward on human rights, or in my case, human rights and humanitarian law, with respect to the specific situation. If you go back and read the reports of any of my predecessors as a special rapporteur in the occupied territories, they have made a range of recommendations based on IHL and IHRL um, uh, in ways in which to either improve the situation of the Palestinians living under the occupied, uh, in the occupied Palestinian territories, and ways in which to try to encourage or force Israel to try to bring an end to the occupation. If you read uh, UN Security Council and UN General Assembly resolutions, um, and I'm not saying recent ones, I, ones going back as far as 1980, in Resolution 476 in June 1980, said there was an urgent need to bring an end 
to the 13-year-old prolonged occupation. Um, if it was prolonged in 1980, and if there was an urgent need identified by the Security Council to bring it to an end in 1980, what are you to make of a, an occupation that's now 37 years older in 1950? I think it was an uh, urgent need to bring it to an end in negotiations, and I think that, uh, you know, you, you don't seem to think that that is the way to go, but coercion is. Well, no, I guess, I guess my point is, is, is that um, negotiations have, have led nowhere, um, uh, that the uh, continuation of the occupation is largely in the hands of the occupying power. There is a great asymmetrical range of power between the occupying power and the protected people under occupation. Um, the, uh, Kofi Annan said in March 2002 that there is no conflict in the world where the end goal based on international law is so clear as in the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which is basically a two-state solution, a genuine state for the Palestinians, based on the 1967 borders um, and the return of the occupied territory to the Palestinians, which includes the West Bank, Israel, and, uh, and Gaza. And that would have to mean um, the evacuation of the settlers and the, and the settlements that go with it. When I look at recent statements by uh, the Prime Minister of, of Israel, he has said on three different occasions in, in recent months, number one with respect to Jerusalem, East Jerusalem, Jerusalem is ours, united and forever. So there's no intention of wanting to give up on the annex, illegally annexed in, uh, East Jerusalem. Number two, he said at the end of August of 2017, there'll be no further uprooting of any Jewish settlements anywhere in the, uh, um, in the, in the territories. Those are Jewish and those are ours forever. And he said three days ago that the Jordan Valley is, uh, is, is and will always be Israel's. So it doesn't leave very much left for, uh, for the Palestinians to want to negotiate, aside from a Bantustan of a strip thin going from Janine at to the top down to Hebron in the south. So I'm, in, in terms of what the negotiation position is of Israel, the negotiation position of the Palestinians, which, which I would suggest is probably relatively close to where international law is, um, there's a unbridgeable gulf. Again, aren't you straying I'm afraid I'll have to give the next question. There, there are two more waiting, um, and then we're going to have to wrap up. Sure. Thanks a lot. Matthew Lee, Inner City Press. I, I guess in order to, to – to, I'd love to hear your analysis applied to, for example, Western Sahara, which is another occupation that, yep. uh, on the mm – -hmm. but I went to, to, to follow up on – you'd said that you'd never seen a, a, a John Dugard report that, that, that dealt with the other side of the issue, and there, the, the, the site is – a slash 60 slash 271. That's okay. one of them. And I'm, I'm happy to take that, but, okay. but, I, but I, I did say I had not read all sure, of those reports. Sure, absolutely. And yes. I just, on the same topic, I just, I just, it's good to hear your, your view. Hanu Hallinan, who is another special rapporteur on the same mandate, yeah. even absent a change of mandate, sought to visit pr prisons, Palestinian prisons, to visit yeah. prisoners. So clearly, I guess I, if you could say, do you feel that there's nothing, and, I, and I'm asking mostly, in the case of sort of journalists, like we're yeah. journalists here, and there are a number yeah. of journalists, there's been a sort of a decay in in in, in freedom. There's Jihad Barakat is somebody that was arrested for for filming uh, uh, Abbas going through an Israeli checkpoint. There's Tariq Abu Zaid. So I'm just wondering, are you aware of these cases? In the case, in the co course of carrying out your mandate, do cases of journalists arrested yeah. come to your attention? Yeah. And if so, why do you choose not to look into them as how Hanu Halinan did in even under the existing mandate? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, and you've, okay, you, you've sparked, you've sparked a, a new question in my mind with respect to that. I'm happy to go back and see, see those. And, you know, if they have used a creative interpretation that fits within the wording of the mandate, then maybe I don't need to ask for permission from the Human Rights Council. I do know that, uh, um, as I said, Richard Falk did say he asked for uh, and hadn't received. Um, but. I am acutely aware of what goes on with respect to the PA and, uh, and Hamas. Um, I've met human rights defenders, uh, most recently Issa Amro, who um, is, uh, I think, a strong voice for nonviolent resistance to the occupation based in Hebron, inspiring many youth in, in Palestine to, to do that, who was arrested and kept in uh, uh, Palestinian detention for, uh, for a week. Uh, I make, you know, there should be no division with respect to human rights. 
one of the guiding points of, um, of, human, of human rights is that they are indivisible. Um, and my intention was to be able to come to a decision and make a recommendation come, uh, come March when I next appear before the Human Rights Council. But, you know, if um, at your suggestion of the last two of you, if you think that there are creative ways within the, the, the current mandate to be able to do that, then I'm all ears. Uh, I'm all ears with respect to that because no side is an angel with respect to this. And you did ask about Western Sahara. I'm not going to comment directly on Western Sahara, other than to say, Matt, that the four-part test that I've come up with with respect to judging whether a protract, protracted occupation would lead the occupier into being an illegal occupant is meant to be a universal test. It is not so designed solely and only for the situation of Israel and Palestine. We'll just be able to take one last yeah. question, then we have another press conference. Okay, uh, Ben Ivansky, Fox News. Um, you work for Sorry, I, 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 Ben Ivansky, Fox News. Fox News, yes. Yeah. You work for the Human Rights Council, which is very anti-Israel, as everybody knows. How do you think the Israelis can take you seriously when you're appointed by a council that comes up with so many anti-Israeli resolutions and attacks on that country? Secondly, you mentioned uh, BDS uh, as an example of a civil uh, society group. BDS is seen by many as being anti-Semitic. What's your view on BDS? Mm -hmm. And just last, last point, you say, you say that Gaza is still occupied? Please explain that. Okay. First of all, with respect to the, you know, to the uh, Human Rights Council, I'm appointed by the Human Rights Council, but I, it, my position is as a, uh, something akin to an ombudsperson. I have, I'm appointed as an expert. I'm not paid by them. I'm an, I'm, uh, I keep my full-time job as a law professor in Canada, and I have, I have the independence to be able to choose the topics that I want to be able to choose within the framework of my mandate to be able to do that. Um, um, so I'm, I'm not employed by them, I don't work for them, I'm not an employee of the United Nations or of the Council. Um, with respect to the Human Rights Council being um, anti-Israel, I think I've answered that already, but I'm happy to repeat the answer. Item 7, um, the, the permanent item 7 on the agenda of the Human Rights Council, um, is there not with respect to Israel, with respect to the Israeli occupation of the Palestinian territory. And as long as Israel occupies, and I'm, I'm suggesting occupies illegally uh, a, someone else's territory in defiance of 40 plus resolutions of the, of the Security Council, 100 plus uh, resolutions of the General Assembly, uh, dictate, um, and, and uh, rulings from the International Court of Justice, there will probably be a continued focus at the Human Rights Council and at the United Nations until that ends. Once that ends, Israel becomes a normal na nation like any other nation, and the focus will, be, will disappear. I'm, I could guarantee you that. So if, um, if the focus is on Israel, I say it's not an anti-Israel uh, focus or obsession, it's an anti-occupation focus. Yeah, and lastly, you mentioned Gaza. And BDS, I, I take no position with respect to BDS other than to say that BDS is a, um, if it longs it remains nonviolent, it's a form of free expression for people anywhere to be able to protest or oppose any particular country, any particular company that they think is causing harm to them or to others, or in some way interferes with the pursuit of social justice. Whether or not, uh, I take no position as to whether or not BDS is a wise or an unwise move. Um, I, if it did veer into the realm of being um, anti-Semitic, I've not seen evidence with respect to that, but if it did, um, you know, then, then I would think it's crossed a bright red line. But as long as those who advocate for BDS um, operate within the realm of free speech, operate within the realm of, of, of peaceful demonstrations or peaceful um, uh, disobedience, then it strikes me as entirely within the laws protected in most countries under free expression and freedom of speech. With respect to Gaza, uh, Gaza remains occupied. They, uh, that remains not my opinion. 
that remains the opinion, I believe, of the, of the bulk of the international community, that as long as Israel, the occupying power, um, controls the, the air uh, and sea borders and most of the land borders of Gaza, that it controls what goes in and what leaves uh, Gaza, um, then it's a form of occupation, even though there aren't boots on the ground. And if I can quote um, one um, Israeli spokesperson that I have mentioned in, the, um, um, in my report, which is the uh, former head of the, uh, of the Israeli Mossad, um, he acknowledged that the – I'm sorry, I don't have it handy, but it is in the report – um, but he acknowledged that uh, Israel, here it is, as Tamir Pardu, former head of Israel's Mossad, recently stated, quote, Israel is responsible for the humanitarian situation in Gaza, and this is the place with the biggest problem in the world today. Um, my sense is that... The context of that is you're totally quoting I'm, this out of context, uh, just for your information. I, I'm not. I've, I've read the entire, I've read the entire uh, piece, and I'll have to disagree with you on that, okay? I'm terribly sorry, but we do have to end now because we have a press conference on Burundi, which we're already a few minutes late for. Thanks very much. Thank you very much for all coming.